Welcome to Culture on I-24 News. I'm Oded Grober. Thank you so much for joining me. Today on our program, musician Yossi Sassi will be here to talk about his new album and play a little for us. A live stream of an underwater photography event in Eilat breaks records. And we'll celebrate the 20-year anniversary of Friends. Yossi Sassi is an Israeli musician and founding member of Oriental metal band Orphaned Land that's been around since 1991. Only a few months ago, Yossi left the band to focus on his solo career and he recently released his second solo album called Desert Butterflies. Earlier today, we had Yossi here in the studio. Here's our conversation. Yossi Sassi, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me here. So uh, tell me about your new album, uh, Desert Butterflies, am I right? Yes, indeed. Uh, Desert Butterflies is my second uh, album as a solo artist, although I've been uh, producing music and composing since uh, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And this album was recorded uh, as a musical journey around the world in uh, four countries in three continents from Japan through Europe uh, and the Middle East through up to the New United States. And wow. it features some uh, really great friends and uh, talented guest musicians, such as the uh, guitarist of uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, Ron Bumblefoot, Tal, and uh, Marty Friedman, also a Grammy-nominated artist, ex-Megadeth cool. guitar player. Yeah, and um, I'm very, very pleased with the result. Great. Uh, now you've uh, you've as as uh, we said you've uh, left uh, Orphan Land after a long time to to mm -hmm. focus on your solo career. How is it different for you working on your thing? Well, uh, for better and for worse, uh, you're out there alone, you know. Mm -hmm. So you for for the compliments as well as the critics because uh, you can't hide behind a, a band. Mm -hmm. Although I was also uh, a pivot, I played a very pivotal role in Orphanland as well as a composer and producer as well mm -hmm. of uh, of a vast majority of the material. Uh, still here, um, it feels more liberated in a way because I can truly explore uh, the music that I want to do, the next big authentic uh, step in, uh, in my musical involvement, right. rather than being confined to you know, something that has been ongoing for three decades. Right, now. it gives you an opportunity to try maybe something new that the fans of Orphan Land have, haven't, uh, um, aren't used to necessarily. Uh, sure. Now, let, let's talk about the music for a second. Uh, it's been called Oriental Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you live with that definition? Well, it's, it's uh, quite a narrow definition. Uh, if you want to impose a definition on, on this music, that's probably the closest. But okay. uh, I'd say it's really a diverse uh, plethora of uh, merging roots with contemporary music. It what really has- What are some of your influences? Uh, Turkish music, Egyptian, um, all kinds of Arabic music, Greek music, as well as uh, rock and roll, blues and uh, fusion, some light jazz even. Now, some of these sounds you grew up with, some you picked up along the way, am I right? Yes, I grew up in a family of uh, Jews coming from Iraq and uh, North Africa, Libya, as well as Greece. And mm -hmm. uh, I listened to a lot of Turkish, Egyptian, Greek music, etc. as a child. And when I uh, grew up uh, as a teenager, I uh, came across uh, music of uh, rock bands and metal bands, such as Guns N' Roses and Metallica. And then when I uh, grabbed the guitar for the first time, this fusion, this merging of two worlds, they, they collided into a into genre. A, that, a beautiful result. Now, yeah. uh, this is, uh, your, your music is very popular also in, in some Arab countries, in Turkey, in, uh, in many places around the world. Mm -hmm. How do they accept you as an Israeli musician? Well, it's, it's never uh, an issue because uh, the power of music is, uh, as a universal language is that it allows us to unite people regardless of uh, their origin. And uh, I come as a musician, n not as a citizen uh, of some nationality, etc. Okay. So, but I'm sure that there are cases where the, the, the personal story uh, uh, becomes more important. To... Yeah, it's, it's true that, that these worlds often uh, collide together. Uh, we had a, a Lebanese dancer. It, she's danced uh, with, with us also in Orphaland and also in my solo tour mm -hmm. in Europe. We mm -hmm. had a Lebanese dancer coming with us on tour. 
And uh, we had, uh, I have people that I've played for, I, I have my guest solos in bands from Kuwait and from the United Emirates. Wow. Uh, yeah, actually, just recently. Uh, and are they, is, is it okay for them to, to keep working uh, in, in Kuwait or in Lebanon or? Um... I, I think, uh, to put it simple, that they take their chances right. happily and they, they feel uh, whole and complete with that because uh, the, the power to, of music, that yeah. uh, it wants to be liberated and be, to, to just happen in the world is stronger than any misconception or biased. I, I, I pray that you, you know. are uh, <laughs> right about that. You have a very uh, special instrument that you brought with us. What is this thing? Indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, this thing is uh, the Buzukitara. Buzukitara, yes. of course. How it's, did I not know that? Yeah, it's, it's one of the nicknames. We, we <laughs> call this, uh, this merging of uh, buzuki, acoustic buzuki, uh, traditional Greek mandolin. Uh, with an electric guitar, mm -hmm. uh, a modern electric guitar, along with an acoustic guitar with some technology we've built into it. So it's actually three guitars in one, and wow. it's it's an embodiment of my musical journey. It's the east and the west, the electric and the acoustic. The, they just recite together those souls in the same body, and That's it great. really resembles my my pioneering sound, the one I've been doing for three de three decades now. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, when uh, and where will there be an opportunity to hear you play it in the future? What what uh, shows do you have coming up? Uh, we have uh, tour dates coming up for uh, next year, for 2015 in Europe, and uh, we just finished an Israeli tour, summer tour uh, all around Israel, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Tel Aviv, etc. All right, so uh, luckily yeah. we don't have to wait till 2015. Uh, nope. You're going to play something for us here? Yes, gladly. What are you going to play? I'm going to play uh, the song Cocoon. Uh, from your new album? From the album Desert Butterflies, yes. Let's hear it, Yossi Sassi. Thank you. Gladly. Just Sassy, thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Now, as uh, part of the 10th anniversary celebrations of the underwater photo competition in Eilat, a new Guinness World Record was set last week, one for the largest audience for a live streamed underwater event. Daniel Campos was there. On Friday morning of September the 12th, hundreds of ambitious divers entered the waters of the exotic Red Sea with a common goal, to break the Guinness record of the largest audience for a live-streamed underwater event. For the operation, hundreds of divers, 26 diving instructors, 
32 production members and 12 professional photographers dived together at the missile boat wreck in Israel's most southern city of Eilat. Some of the most sophisticated technology played an important role in the event. Well-protected HD cameras that are used for filming inside the water, waterproof cables and a satellite HD broadcast station which sent a signal that enabled the live stream making it available for millions of online viewers and smartphone users from all over the world who took part in this extraordinary event. But technology is not enough if you don't have leadership and professionalism, and therefore the legendary French diver, cinematographer, and environmentalist Christian Petron was invited to head the video team and also to be one of the head jurors of the photography competition. Petron helped popularize underwater cinematography, and he was the director of photography for Luc Besson's The Big Blue, Atlantis, and he was also the key man for Discovery Channel's Titanic. I come almost every year to Eilat. I know the organizer, David Pilosov, for 40 years, and he invited me as jury member. My role in Eilat is to participate in the event and to judge the photos and especially movies with the jury. The excitement could be witnessed in the faces of the tourists who enjoyed the underwater adventure from the screens of bars and restaurants. But to break this new Guinness record, there's no place for mistakes. I think here we are here in Eilat and everything has to work. We have no chance if something is going down or something breaks or something, everything has to work. That's necessary. The event was part of the 10th anniversary celebration of the prestigious Eilat Red Sea International Underwater Photo Competition, where 281 underwater photographers from 27 countries participated in the World Shootout Competition. I was a video photographer there. I photographed with a, the big camera and with the GoPro, all the, uh, all the divers behind the scenes. For many visitors, it was their first time in Israel. And we came from Taiwan. Well, actually, it's our first time to come to Israel. And uh, yeah, actually, we enjoy here. The Red Sea is beautiful, the water is clear. Of course, the, friend, uh, the people are friendly. The challenge was also a life-changing experience for many of the divers. I've never been in a thing like this. It's really nice to see many people that uh, are doing the same, that love the sea and scuba diving. The goal was reached, a new record in the Guinness Book was set, but it was time for the divers to go home. Those who remained at sea were those who stay above surface, such as the kite and windsurfers, and also the tourists. And the fish. Now it's uh, time for Shachar Pellet segment off screen. Shachar, you're going to talk about Friends. I am. It's a been 20 years. From the past, it's been 20 years since that show came into our what lives. What do you remember about it? You, you were, uh, uh, what, a baby? No, that is not true. I watched every single episode. <laughs> now, it, when it first came into our life, it was described as not very entertaining, clever, or original. Now, you might still think that way, but most of the world doesn't. It didn't, and it doesn't until today. 20 years ago, its first episode aired September 1994, and 10 years after its final episode, 2000. It's still considered to be crowned the most dominant sitcom of the 90s and with its endless reruns up until today. Most dominant sitcom of the 90s? Hello? Yes. Fine. Well, with 30 million uh, viewers per episode, it was the dominant uh, sitcom of the 90s and until today, it still represents this ideal of 20-something vibe and people still relate to it until today. Here's an interesting quote for why. Friends created a coffee-scented cocoon that millions wanted to enter. They, they represented the me uh, decade of individualism, which continues until today with the selfie era. And they s sat there for the first time in that coffee shop saying, it's OK to be selfish, it's OK to be self-centered. And people loved it. They wanted to be... Um... It's not OK to be not <laughs> funny. <laughs> no, they were funny. People <laughs> found them hilarious. Come on, Odette. People wanted to be friends, and they wanted to be on Friends. And so we saw Julia Roberts, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, mm -hmm. Robin Williams, Billy Crystal, so many guests yeah. on this show throughout the years. It was incredible. And if we take a look at the legacy of Friends up until today, it's actually incredible. It, though it turned into more cynical times, we've got Two Broke Girls, which is a darker version of uh, humor and how to make it in the big city. Like we've just got Monica and, and uh, what's her yes, face, the other one? Uh, <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> uh, we could take a look at uh, How I Met Your Mother or The Big Bang Theory, which is more like a hipster Friends. And there's Lena Dunham's Girls, which is, and I quote, 
friends with tattoos, raves, cocaine, and actual sex. Which means nothing like friends. No, no, everyone loved friends, come on. And, and up until today, people want and beg for a reunion. They're probably not going to get it. Um, they got uh, something uh, like it. Yeah, that Jimmy Kimmel reunion is something that I think everyone would like to stay with the old memories. Um, there is, however, tomorrow an opening of Central Perk Cafe in Manhattan really? for a month for the celebrations of the 20th anniversary. Oh, that's nice. And we'll finish with some anecdotes maybe you didn't know about Friends. First of all, it was initially called Insomnia Cafe, the most interesting and um, the most uh, generated interest of uh, the characters was Monica and the co-writers Martha uh, Kaufman and David Crane are also the co-writers of the um, um, theme song I'll be there for you. All right, I did like the flashbacks. Thank you uh, so much Shachal. Thank you. Uh, as always it was beautiful. Thank you at home for joining us as well. Please be sure to join us again tomorrow.